often wondered what it would be like in heaven surrounded by all of the glorious choirs, you know, and as I'm sitting up here and I hear the piano and I hear the choir, I think I'm almost in heaven. Well, maybe not quite, but close. Text in the mail, yes. Who's number one? You know, being important, being number one, is kind of a theme that we really see a lot in the, in the world in which we live. People strive for that. Sports fans. Villanova really blew it for me. Oh. Oh, I had them as number one in my bracket. <laughs> All done, you know. Philadelphia fans, we kind of walk with that, whether it's baseball or football or whatever. Being number one in your graduating class, being the number one music video, the number one box office hit on Broadway. Oh, that's, that's, that's it. Strive for that. But there's some number ones that aren't necessarily so desirable. Being number one on the FBI's most wanted list. Not so. The number one cancer-causing agent. Eh. Number one worst city to live in. The number one worst restaurant to eat in. You know, some of those we really don't look to have number one marked to it. But what about being number one on the list that God hates? What about being number one on the list that God hates? In our day in which we live, we as Christians often label various sins according to how we think them to be. We see one or we read about one or we're, we're aware of certain sin and we say, oh, that's got to be the worst because we think it is. We, we perceive this as the, the most heinous thing ever because that's how we feel it is. For example, we would surely presume that, that stealing is much worse than lying. Homosexuality, much worse than taking the name of the Lord in vain. But we're not the judge of those things. God is. It's his court. It's his standards. It's his rules. And it's not how I see it, but it's how God marks it as this is and this is not. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 6. I'm going to read 16 through 19. Just a little bit past the book of Psalms, right after Psalms, right in the middle of your Bible. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Here we have Solomon listing seven things that are an abomination to God. Don't touch it, <laughs> you know. Keep away from it, completely forbidden. Six sixteen. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceiveth deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. As God permits, I'd like to take the first one of these seven, and then Lord willing, he doesn't return, we're going to take number two tonight. You know, you look at these and you see, well, Number one, the proud look, he's placed this number one in order as, as far as these sevens are concerned, and I'd like to say that it's number one as far as importance. Number one as far as is in order, but also importance. Other places in the, in the Old Testament, a proud look is often called haughty eyes. It's like something my grandmother would say, you know, oh, you've got haughty eyes, you know. Literally, it means a high look. You're, you're looking up above. And we kind of get that idea. It's how I look at you and what that look means. Because it's a reflection of my heart. 
I can look at somebody not thinking, understanding, or, you know, we say it's, it's my countenance, my demeanor. And when it comes to this particular section, we understand what a proud look is. I can consider myself above others the way I dress, my intelligence, the community I live in, the car that I drive, my, uh, my whatever. And I look at you and I evaluate you because of what I am and I feel that I am above you for whatever reason that I have dictated. When we lived in the Philippines, outside of the presidential palace in Manila, Melikanyan Palace, there was a huge wall around it, obviously for protection. But when the President and Mrs. Marcos would come out, their limousines were always very darkened windows. You know, in some ways, say, well, that was security. Just outside the walls are tremendous slums. And I'd like to think that even though they would say, oh, we are for all people, I'd like to think that the president and his wife didn't want to look at the lifestyle of the people that was around there. You know, we don't want to look at the poor, the suffering. We're just above that type of thing. But you know, it's just not a look. The look can be accompanied by a, a sigh, even a quick comment, a snub, and avoidance. And I think we've all received that at one time or another. You've been a recipient of somebody with a proud look, haughty eyes, a snub, huh, you, know, huh, you know, whatever it is. And I think we have all given it to others in one form or another. We've, we've looked upon them in some form of disdain, some form of a hard attitude that says, I am better than you. And I convey that in a look, but it's from my heart, and it's all that I am. It's been done to different ethnic groups. Way back in early American history, the Irish were the, were the lowest of lows. When the Irish came over, they received the, the, the dirtiest of jobs, and then it went to the Italians. And then it went to the Chinese, and then it went on to every other group because, well, your English isn't very good. Your food tastes weird. You know, you only can get the jobs that are minimum wage or, or whatever the case is. We evaluate anything that is different, and we immediately make those judgment calls. Some would refer to it as a matter of prejudice. I'd like to say it, it's a matter of pride, the proud look, how we evaluate and how we react or interact. So the great danger of pride is that it becomes the foundation of all unrighteousness and it is a trap. Listen to these verses. Proverbs 11.2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. 1618. Pride goeth before, you know that one? Fall, destruction, the fall, you know, same pre a haughty spirit before a fall, you know. Uh, 2923, a man's pride shall bring him low. Knock him off his horse. First John 216, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the Pride of life. So even the apostle comes along and he says, the, the triple threat in the heart of man, one of those is the matter of pride. One of those sits up there and says, this is a grand destroyer. The pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. It becomes that which is a foundational building stone for tremendous tragedy. As a matter of fact, the word pride is used 53 times in the Old and New Testament, and not once is it mentioned in a positive way. And we have a lot of things to be, well, I'm proud to be an American, you know. I'm proud of this and I'm proud of that. But as you go through the scriptures, even though there may have been pride involved in, I'm proud to be a believer, a follower of Paul, or whatever it is, 
not once in those 53 times is it used as a, in, in a good context. It's always as a warning. You know. It's always as a great danger, a red flag, a flashing light, a screaming high-pitched siren. And yet it's part of our daily life. It is ever before us, teasing us, calling us, whispering us, tempting us to make some greater achievement that will make my flesh feel better, but yet it never satisfies. If I can reach this, I'll feel better for myself, and I'll be above somebody else, and my pride swells, and if I can do this, but I've never achieved a place where I am finally satisfied. Pride keeps you hungering and thirsting because it never reaches its goal. But its goal, as we know, is to be brought low and destroyed. The book of Esther, it was Haman's pride that caused him to destroy or seek to destroy the Jews in Persia. And the irony was that he was hung on the very gallows that he had constructed to hang Mordecai and the other Jews. You read through that, and, and, and Haman was a Jew. He was a man who had come out of Jerusalem, but he find, found that living in, in this area, that life was so good that he was above everybody there. So I got to destroy the competition, and he was destroyed by it. Acts chapter 12, we ring of, read of King Herod the Great sitting on his throne, uh, dressed in his best, and speaking to the people of an authority. And the people shouted, it is the voice of a God and not a man. What do you think that does to somebody? You know? How dangerous it is when, when somebody gets up and they start performing on stage as, as a, in, in eloquence. And it's a danger for a pastor. It's a grave danger for him to, all of a sudden as he leaves, oh, great sermon, Pastor. Now, we finish up today. We go on out. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? You start to say, oh, great. And all of a sudden, his head becomes so big and he starts popping his buttons because I am proud of what I've done rather than acknowledging the fact that this is God's hand that is there. It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And because his pride kept him from giving the glory that God truly had deserved, the scripture says he was eaten with worms and he died right then. Well, the maggots were the only byproduct of this disease that had been eating through his body for a long time before. Just as pride has always continued to consume the soul, it was a trap and Herod fell into it. And obviously many others. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. In the end of the 12 months he was taken, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon and the king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that which I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? He can see it by the words. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling place shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like the oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair, his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. You, know, you see the man, and he was, in, he was used of God in a position in a time, an important time in Israel's history, but as he stood up, and, and Babylon was a tremendous city. Archaeologists have gone and, and found how they had, had taken water from miles away and channeled it to the palace, 
and had an auger system that took at the top of the palace and brought it in water, which became, you know, these beautiful Babylonian gardens, you know. Brilliant people. And he took upon himself the accolade of that which only God had deserved. Now, surely he could have said, we've done this, and this was done by God. And, and this, you wouldn't have had to have that vegetarian diet. Pride causes me to seek, seek things that are, that are not, but as I would want them to be, or as I would think them to be. Pride leads to destructions like animals being led to the slaughter. Pride gives me an improper understanding of what could be or what should be. And it causes me to go in that direction, to pull me out of what would be obvious to somebody else. The Book of Mormon says, As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. Wow. That's the whole bent of this, this crooked theology. You can become God. To presume and to act upon life as if we were in control, that we could ignore God, has established truth as pride and leads to destruction. So many Mormons, as you've talked to them, they just don't quite see that. But we can become like God, even God himself. During the Battle of the Wilderness in Northern Virginia, during the American Civil War, Union General John Sedgwick was out inspecting his troops. And at one point, he came on the walls and overlooked the uh, situation, the direction that the enemy was at as they were approaching the fort. And his officers suggested that this was a real smart thing, General, to be standing up there in evidence to all of the enemy. And he says, nonsense. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And at that moment, the bullet from a sniper fatally wounded General Sedgwick. His pride says, the enemy, they could never touch me. They couldn't shoot. And boom, and that was it. So not only is pride a trap that brings destruction, but secondly, it is the same way that it separates us from God. It brings destruction in the life of men, literally, but it also brings destruction in the hearts of men. Our scripture reading this morning, again, from Luke 18, attitude maintained by the Pharisee, the, uh, the man who had great religious pride of himself. Once again, also he spoke the parable to some who trusted in themselves. Okay, trusting in themselves echoes pride. And he said that they were righteous and despised others. And two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other the tax collector. And the Pharisee stood, prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Can you see it? He's in a position physically, logistically, in the temple where everybody can see him and see who he is. And no doubt his voice was such that they could hear him, even this tax collector in the back of the room. I'm not like these other people. And who's he talking about? The tax collector, an extortioner, an unjust man, an adulterer, even this, if you don't know him by now, even this tax collector. He's, he's describing his heart even in these words. And then he talks about the positive things that he does. I fast twice weekly, which was more than was required. I give of tithes of all that I possessed you know, I'm, I'm giving, I'm, I'm doing so much for the church. I'm doing all of these things that God recognizes me, that puts me in a place above everybody else. The tax collector, the, uh, this, this publican, stands in the back corner, uh, doesn't want to even look up to, to God, totally opposite of this other man. And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Beats upon his chest. He asks that God will not judge him for what he deserves. He recognizes there's nothing private in that. He's not saying, you know, you know, I'm, this is who I am. I've collected all this money. I've done this and that. And Jesus says that this tax collector goes back home justified in the sight of God. 
he was humbled and God exalted his humility to the point of salvation, to the point of relationship with them. The problem with a person who thinks that he or she is perfect is that they have no room for improvement. I am, I have these things. Why, what improvement do, do I need? That means I have to give up something. There is not, they're not willing to do that. They will not come back to seek God because pride by its very nature separates us from God. God removed King Saul from the throne because his pride placed him in a position that simply would not cause him to obey God. Told to completely destroy the Amalekites, Saul goes and leads into the battle and does all except for kill the king, kill Amalek, and some of the flock. The prophet comes and he says, you are supposed to obey God completely. The Bible says that he failed to do that because it was his pride. The Bible says of King Uzziah that he was successful in all of his domestic affairs. He was a king that ruled his land powerfully and greatly. Foreign affairs, military affairs. Second Chronicles 26, 16 says, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. There's a parallel that goes on. As pride comes, it removes my relationship with God because I have to have a dependence upon him for all things, which goes counter to everything in the world that we try to do. You can do it, you know. You can do it. You, you, you can be all that you want to be, you know. Uh, watching the, uh, the, the, the basketball uh, NCAA preps and all of that, and the father has one son in UCLA. Yeah, uh, what's it called? The ball, ball family. And they have three boys, and they are, they are fantastic. Dad just drilled them and drilled them, and, you know, and so the one who's a freshman is going to go out and and uh, go into uh, pros and the others that he thinks that are even better than any existing pro now. And you can see that there is an effort being involved and there's skills and gifts and so forth, but that pride has taken them far away because their goal is set on anything except their relationship to God. Frank Sinatra made millions of dollars by singing a song that started out and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friends, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway, and more, much more than this. What? I did it my way. And that was Frank Sinatra's life. You know, he did it all. I've traveled here, I've lived here, I've owned this, I've done this, I've done it all, and I've done it my way. And his pride had picked him up to a place as it is so, so many in the world in which we live. And we envy that lifestyle because they did it. You've got goals, go for it. Don't tell, let anybody say that you can't do it. But what happens? Because I end up doing it on my own and God is pushed out of the way. Why does God hate pride? Why does he say, this is an abomination, a number one abomination to me? Because it takes him and puts him aside. He says, I have no room for you because I want to live my, my life my way. I want to do it my way. So what do we do? Some religions would have you shave your head and dress in sandals and, and a bed sheet, owing nothing to no man and going out and begging and keeping yourself humble. Some religions would assert that the flesh is evil. So you have to punish the flesh. Beat it, literally. Bring some blood, you know. The more the better. Starve yourself, whatever is necessary. Well, all of those things don't really bring about humility, do they? Because the man or the woman who does that pretty much says, because I've done this, I am better than you others. Because I've beaten the flesh, because I've sold all I have, because I've just purposely gone to living the life of a beggar, 
I am better to you because my work has placed me closer to God than you. See? So it, it doesn't quite make sense. 19th century South African preacher Andrew Murray wrote, the danger of pride is greater and nearer than we think, and the grace for humility too. The danger of pride, it is greater, far greater than anything we can think. And yet, he adds on to that, that the mercy of God is just as great and just as close. God's mercy, not giving me what I deserve because pride separates me from that. Great grace is available, greater than pride. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the the humble. Grace, giving me something I don't deserve. And he gives it to me because I recognize I can't achieve it. I did it my way. No, I did it his way. The tax collector standing afar off would not so much lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat upon his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He says, I recognize my whole life. And he may have been a very wealthy man. Tax collectors were like that, you know, robbing from the rich, robbing from the poor, keeping a bigger portion of themselves. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everybody who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Let me ask you, who gets the credit in your life? Who, gives, who gets the credit for who you are and what you did? I watched a little clip, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, we lived in near Pittsburgh for a while and that was Mr. Rogers' home and they had uh, uh, some number of awards that he achieved at the end. And for the three that were really recognized, he had the audience, uh, and they were like Emmys or, or whatever, you know, he says, I want you to take just 10 seconds and to think of somebody who is important to you that 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 they would be proud that you're up there you know think of the purpose you know and they were quiet tears going down the eyes of the people you know, you know who was important to you who would you thank how many would say i thank god for what he's done out of sincerity not while we're in church oh i thank god for what he's done but out of their hearts to say god you've done this for me paying lip service to god doesn't count doesn't matter. All we can say, all of the pious platitudes and saying, thank you, God, for what you've done. I've walked your way, you know, and so forth. It doesn't come because he knows the heart. But seeing ourselves as we truly are, sinners saved by grace, living day to day as a result of his mercy, and acknowledging him alone as the source of what we have and who we are and the path that we take, causes me to be humble. I've got nothing to pick myself up and say, I've done it my way. Because he truly did it. He brought the pieces together. He rescued me here. He healed me here. He did this. He did this. I have to recognize it. David Harrell wrote a book telling the story of his father, Edgar Harold. Edgar was one of the 300 survivors of the USS Indianapolis. It was a uh, US uh, cruiser at the end of World War II and it was sunk by the enemy. 600 of the 900 men uh, that survived the ship's sinking were stranded in the water for five days. Uh, there is a really neat book, you can still find it, um, on the US in Indianapolis. Many with only life vests, facing thirst, hunger, injuries, dehydration, and a lot of them died by sharks. He said the water was infested with sharks and they were just torn apart. But in any case, his father wrote, he testified of those days in the ocean. He says, clearly, there were no atheists in the water that day. No life jackets for some. Being in the water, ships gone, middle of the ocean, Sharks all around, no, nothing to drink, nothing to eat for five days. There were no atheists there. Gone was the damnable attitude of pride that deceives men into thinking that there is no God. 
or if there is, they don't need him. When a man is confronted with death, it is the face of the Almighty God that he sees, not his own. We were acutely aware of our Creator during those days and nights. In youth, we're not aware of those things. But as we get closer to death, in whatever fashion that may be, we are acutely aware that what I look at isn't my life, but I'm going to face God. And what happens? See, my pride stands up all life for all long and saying, I did it my way and I got the best out of it. But it ends up that, that <laughs> that's going to end, you know. Pretty soon it ends, one fashion or another. And then what? You see, your personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ your creator, your redeemer, your savior, who keep you humble in the forefront. He does that. And it's not an overnight thing. There's a lot of cleaning up that we have to do each day. Process of sanctification, daily peeling off the old man and putting on the new man, getting rid of those types of things and learning to lean on Jesus. You know that him? Learning to lean, learning to lean on him. Wander from him, and you'll walk in your own pride by yourself on the road to destruction. You know, I can be proud of, of my relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm proud I'm a Christian. But that doesn't mean I came to him by myself. I worked my way in. He saw something that was good in me, that saved me, that made me, brought me into a, a profession, a work, a task, something I'd be taken care of. All it shows me is that I indeed was unworthy. And he came and redeemed me out of that. Pride. Powerful. Powerful. And the Lord has enabled us, as Andrew Murray said, to give us as much mercy as necessary as we struggle with pride. Shall we pray? Father, at whatever we have shared here in this your word, the examples of, of the Pharisee and the publican, or the many verses out of Solomon's pen and Proverbs, and the examples of other men and women in scriptures um, brings us to our knees to say uh, that, Lord, uh, we struggle with pride. It has broken relationships. It has hurt uh, other people because we felt it also. People with pride have looked upon us in disdain and we've been hurt by it. But the greater danger, Father, is breaking our relationship with you or not even knowing you. For my pride says, I can't say that I'm a sinner. My pride says, I can't confess that I need the Lord Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. So, Father, we understand why your word says that you find this to be an abomination, that you despise pride, that you have a disdain for it. So, Father, we confess that we at times have these pride, prideful thoughts and prideful attitudes. Forgive us. Be merciful unto us. Help us, Father, to grow in your grace in the knowledge of our Savior and thereby be solidified in the day in which we live. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close as we turn to our hymnals once again, please. 591, and we'll stand together singing. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. 
whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Amen. Christ only always living in me. That's not pride, is it? The more we draw close to him, the more we see Christ in us. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for our time together here in this your house. As we're dismissed, we pray that the blessing from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit would rest and abide upon each one. And we continue to look forward to the soon return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.